Now let's review the covenant chart. Now I've divided here into the different time periods. Before asking how will I know, we can see that he will make a great nation, he will bless thee and make thy name great. I will bless them that bless thee, curse them that curse thee. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Unto thy seed I will give this land at Shechem. I will make your seed as numerous as the dust of the earth. I will give you the land in every direction as far as you can see. Then after the battle of the nine kings, and he's blessed by Melchizedek in the king's dale. After that, God appears to him tells him, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. You shall have an heir from your own bowels, that your seed shall be as numerous as the stars, and Abram is counted righteous for believing. Then, after Abraham says, How will I know? The smoking furnace, the 400 years of slavery, and they will come out from slavery with great riches, and they are given the land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. They are given borders. It's not everywhere you walk. It's not as far as you can see. It's borders. Then Abram makes Ishmael with his wife's maid, Hagar, the Egyptian. And then El Shaddai, God Almighty, appears to Abram. I will multiply you exceedingly. You will be a father of nations. And he changed his name to Abraham. Your son will, will be named Isaac. Laughter. And he is the heir of the covenant. Ishmael also will be a great nation with 12 princes. Anyone not circumcised shall be cut off from his people. And it's an everlasting covenant to all generations. And they will possess the land of Canaan forever. And this is to the land of Israel. This is, called, this is the beginning of the land of Israel. Now in chapter 18 of Genesis, it begins another story about Abraham. I will paraphrase it to make it faster and easier. But I will encourage everyone to read these parts of the King James Version of the Bible. This story goes back to Abraham laughing when God changed his wife's name from Sarai to Sarah and proclaimed that she would be a mother of nations. And Abraham laughed inside his heart, saying, Shall a child be born to him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And that's why Isaac's name was called Laughter, Isaac. And as Abram was sitting in his tent door in the plains of Memre, that is near Hebron, three men came, and he ran to meet them and bowed himself. And he said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant, but stay and rest and have some water, and I will get some bread for you. And they said, Okay. And Abraham went and got water and bread and a tender calf and butter and milk, and they ate it. And they said to him, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah, who was in the tent, heard it. And she had never had a child, and she had suffered because of it, for not fulfilling the promise of God made to Abraham. She felt like it was her fault. And she was now ninety years old and well past menopause. And she laughed within herself, saying, After I am old, shall I have any pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have a child when I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, according to the time of life, I will return to thee, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, because she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. And Abraham said nothing even though he laughed when he heard it the first time. And the men got up to leave, and Abraham walked with them to see them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing I am going to do? Genesis chapter 18 
beginning in verse 17. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I am going to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now to see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence, and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Preadventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. End quote. And Abraham then bargained God down bit by bit, until he said he will spare Sodom if he finds ten righteous within the city. And they both went on their way, Abraham was, of course, worried about his nephew Lot and his family who lived in Sodom. But he hid that from God also, I suppose. He didn't directly ask him about Lot. Now, in chapter 19, the book of Genesis takes a turn away from Abraham directly and tells the story of God visiting Sodom and Gomorrah. As Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, two angels came, walking, and Lot ran to meet them. He invited them to stay at his place, but they said, No, we will stay in the streets all night. But Lot pressed them greatly until they agreed to stay in his house. After he fed them, but before they turned in for the night, the men of Sodom gathered outside the house. Both young and old, they came and surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Bring out the men that are staying with you, that we may have sex with them. Lot went out to talk to them and offered to give up his two virgin daughters to them, but they would not hear it. They wanted the men. The men of Sodom said, This guy Lot came here to live with us, and now he wants to be our judge. And they pressed in, ready to break the door down. But the two angels pulled Lot into the house and shut the door, and they struck the men of Sodom with blindness. They then told Lot, The Lord has sent us to destroy this place, because the cries of the people against these men have grown great before the Lord. Gather up your family. Lot went to his married daughters and sons-in-law, but the sons-in-law thought he was crazy, and would not come with him, neither did his married daughters. At sunrise, the angels told Lot, Take your wife and your two daughters and flee from the city, so you don't get consumed in the iniquity of the city. As Lot delayed and took his time, the angels grabbed them all by the hand and brought them to the outskirts of the city. And they said, Now run, and do not look back. Do not stay in the plain. Escape into the mountains, so that you are not consumed. But Lot said, Oh, I can't escape to the mountains because I'm afraid something will happen to me there and I die. Let me escape to this little city. It is only a little city if you let me escape there. And the city was called Zoar. It was one of the five cities which fought in the battle of the nine kings. So the angel answered and said, Okay, I will accept this also. I will spare that one city for you, but hurry because I can't act until you are safely in the city. Now the sun was risen when Lot entered Zor, and the Lord rained fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning and was looking toward Sodom from his place on the mountain, and the smoke of the country looked like the smoke of a burning furnace. 
Lot became afraid to dwell in the city of Zoar, so he left the city and moved into a cave in the mountains with his two daughters. Okay, before we continue on the narrative, let's take a look at what happened. First of all, Sodom and Gomorrah had become the poster story against homosexuality. This is where we get the word sodomy or sodomize. Homosexuals are often labeled sodomite by Christians. First of all, yes, homosexuality is definitely a sin in the Bible, but so is adultery, incest, and many other things. The evil men of Sodom were definitely homosexual by nature. They preferred the men over the girls, but was homosexuality the reason that Sodom was destroyed? The reason God gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 verse 20 was because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous. Also the angels told Lot in Genesis chapter 9 13 for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. It sounds like a slight translation problem here but it should say the cry against them has become great. There are many victims praying against these people. They were a mob wanting to gang rape the men who were with Lot. They were trying to break the door down to gang rape these men. This is not a gay couple living together in a consensual relationship. This is violent mob rule. Their sin has gotten so bad that God is taking action against these men. We all have sin in some form, but these men had let sin rule over them to the point that they were a threat to anyone who came into contact with them. This is what Sodom is about, more than just homosexuality. The other interesting thing in this story is how wishy-washy is Lot. He chose to live in this God-forsaken town he tried to protect people from the Sodomites while he tried to reform the Sodomites. He even offered his two virgin daughters to them to protect the men, as if them gang raping the daughters would be any less a crime. He also was afraid to go into the mountains and managed to talk the angels into not destroying the city of Zoar. And then he ended up moving to the mountains anyway because he became to, afraid to dwell in Zoar. He probably saw how bad the people of Zoar were and figured he would end up getting destroyed with them. When he was with his uncle Abraham, he was so rich the land couldn't contain them. He's now living in a cave with his two daughters and they have nothing but what they can carry. Why didn't he take his two daughters and go see Abraham? Perhaps he was too embarrassed because he had nothing left? He seemed to be driven by his fears and not by faith. Now to carry on with the narrative, Lot is living in the cave with his two daughters. The older daughter says to the other, Our father is old and there is no man anywhere to marry and have a family. Let's get our father drunk on wine and make children with him that we might preserve his seed. The first night they got him drunk and the eldest went in and became pregnant from him and he didn't know anything about it the next day. So they did it again the next night for the younger to get pregnant, and he didn't know anything about that either, and the two daughters conceived. The firstborn son was named Moab, which means from the mother's father, and the secondborn son was named Ben-Ami, which means son of my people. These two sons founded two ancient nations who occupied the eastern bank of the Dead Sea, a high cliff line with many caves and deep gorges, as well as a high ground area looking out over the Dead Sea. The nations of Moab and Ammon eventually became a gene pool for Israel because they were family. These nations haven't been seen since the Babylonian invasion into the Holy Land in 586 BC. We will be seeing a lot more of them in future episodes. Now the 20th chapter of Genesis tells us that Abraham journeyed from there south and dwelt between Shur and Kadesh 
and spent his time in Gerar. Gerar is a Philistine town south of Gaza. Abraham met the king of Gerar. His name was King Abimelech. Abraham said to Abimelech of Sarah, She is my sister. Abimelech sent for and took Sarah. But God came to him in a dream and said, Behold, you are but a dead man, because of the woman you have taken is a man's wife. Abimelech had not touched her yet and said, Jehovah, will you also slay a righteous nation? He refers back to the group of nations God just destroyed, which were not too far away. And Abraham and many others were talking about it. He then defends himself, saying that Abraham said she was his sister, and she even said, He is my brother, and all of this was done in innocence. God answered him in the dream and said, I know you have done this in the integrity of your heart. That is why I didn't allow you to touch her. Now restore to the man his wife, because he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not restore her, you will surely die, you and all that are yours. Abimelech woke up very early because of this dream. He called all of his servants and told them everything, and they became afraid. Abimelech called Abraham and said, What have you done to us? What have I done to you that you brought this sin on me and my kingdom? You have done me wrong. What did you see that made you do this? Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will kill me and take my wife. And because she is my sister, from the same father, but a different mother, and she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I asked her to say, no matter where we go, that I am her brother. And after hearing this, Abimelech gave Abraham sheep, oxen, and male and female slaves, and gave them to Abraham. And he said, You can go anywhere in my land and live where you like. And he restored Sarah to him along with one thousand pieces of silver. And he said to Sarah, See, I have given your brother one thousand pieces of silver to show that he is to you a covering of the eyes to everyone with you and to everyone else. And in this way she was at fault. And Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his female servants, and they began bearing children, because God had closed all the wombs of the woman in Abimelech's kingdom because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So now that all of this has happened, let's analyze it. They did this before in Egypt, in the second half of chapter 12 of Genesis. The Pharaoh gave Abraham all kinds of riches because he liked his sister. And when he found out she was his wife and that the plagues had come upon Egypt because of Abraham, he kicked them out of the country along with all of his gifts. But it seems that Abraham had reconciled that with God through Melchizedek. When he kept his vow that he would not take anything from the battle lest anyone claim that they had made Abraham rich. But now... King Abimelech, king of the Philistine city, marries them, Abraham and Sarah. And he gives Abraham 1,000 pieces of silver for the dowry, and he declares Abraham and Sarah married. He then reproves Sarah for deceiving him, as in being available when she's not available, or being not covered when she is covered. God had always considered them married. He had already promised them a child together. But I suppose this is a great healing for Sarah. All of this confusion over whether she was his brother or his wife was finally over. And guess what happens next? Sarah becomes pregnant at 91 years old and bears a son to Abraham at the appointed time that God had promised. Isaac, the promised one, actually happened. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all that hear will laugh with me. And Abraham circumcised Isaac at eight days old, as God had commanded. Sarah also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would give him a child, because I have borne him a son in his old age? And Isaac... <laughs> 
So she's taken the credit for giving Abraham a son after all of this. <laughs> and Isaac grew and was weaned. So Abraham held a feast on that day. Then Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, teasing Isaac. And she said to Abraham, Cast out the slave woman and her son, because the son of this slave will not be the heir with my son Isaac. This grieved Abraham very much because of his son Ishmael, who was 14 years older than Isaac, who was just being weaned. God said to Abraham, Don't worry about the boy or your slave girl. Do all that Sarah has said, because in Isaac your seed will be called. And also the son of the slave girl, I will make a great nation, because he is your seed. Now here God reminds Abraham of the promises he has given him. The time when Abraham laughed, when Sarah received her name, and was called the mother of nations. And Isaac received his name from God before he was even conceived. Isaac means laughter. Isaac here is named by God also, but Ishmael is not named, because he does not share in the promise of the covenant. He is only referred to as the lad, or the son of the slave woman. God also reminds him of his promise to Ishmael that he had made when Ishmael was born, and the covenant of circumcision was made, that he will also be a great nation. This event is also used as a teaching aid by the Apostle Paul to explain the two covenants, one of works and one of faith. I already have read from the Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 5, but I skipped over chapter 4 because in this chapter Paul makes another argument against Gentile Christians being circumcised using Isaac and Ishmael as an example. Genesis chapter 4 verse 21. Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, and he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai which genders to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children but Jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all for it is written rejoice thou barren that bears not break forth and cry thou that travails not for the desolate has many more children than she which has a husband now we brethren as Isaac was are the children of promise but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what says the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. End quote. Here Paul is putting Ishmael, and the Jewish teachers in the same class as persecutors of Christians. We should be careful and make sure we have all of the information before we pass judgment on any group of people today. These groups that we are discussing have all been known by God from the beginning, and God still has a plan for each one of them. Make sure you are not going against God in your judgment. We still have many prophecies to study, and we do live in a free and just society. These classes of people move in and out of interactions with God through time, and we have only begun to understand it. Now, just to back that up, with Paul's teachings, I'll read Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Do you know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he makes intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thy altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what says the answer of God to him? 
I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Jumping ahead to verse 18, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou stands by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. End quote. The next morning Abraham woke up early the next day, and he took bread and a bottle of water, and he strung it over her shoulder and sent Hagar and Ishmael away. She wandered in the desert of Beersheba. After the water was gone and they were exhausted, she left the boy under a shrub and sat about a bowshot away, because she didn't want to see him die, and she wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, What's wrong, Hagar? Fear not, because God heard the voice of the boy where he is. Arise, lift up the boy and hold him, because I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well, and she filled the bottle and gave the boy water. And God was with the boy, and he lived in the desert and became an archer. And he lived in the desert of Paran, and his mother got him a wife out of Egypt. At that time, Abimelech, the king of Gerar, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all you do. Now swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, or with my son, or with my son's son. But according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me, and to the land where you have lived. Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abimelech said, I don't know who has done this thing, neither did you tell me. I haven't heard of it until today. Abraham separated seven female lambs from the flock. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What do these seven lambs which you have set by themselves mean? And he said, These seven lambs you shall take from me, and they shall be a witness to me that I have dug this well. And he called that place Beersheba, which means well of an oath, because there they swore an oath, both of them. This is how they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his army, returned to the land of the Philistines, and Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and he called there on the name of the Lord, the Eternal God, and Abraham lived in the Philistines' land for many days. There is a connection between this well and the well Hagar was led to. They are the same well. This is called the well of an oath, or Beersheba. Abraham made Abimelech swear an oath that Abraham dug the well, and at this well God remembered his oath to Abraham that Ishmael would also be a great nation when he saved Ishmael's life by leading Hagar to the well. God did not answer Hagar's cries for help, but when the mother left the boy under a bush, the boy cried and God heard him. Beersheba became the southern border of Israel in later times. Today it is the fourth largest city in Israel. After this God tested Abraham. In the King James Version it says tempted, but the word tempted by modern definitions seems that he wants you to lose. It actually means tested. God tells Abraham to take his only son Isaac, whom he loves, and go to the land of Moriah to a mountain God will show him, and offer up Isaac as a burnt offering to God. Abraham woke up early the next morning, and took two servants and Isaac, and went to Moriah. On the third day Abraham saw the place far off, 
There he left his servants with the donkey, and he and his son went on by foot. He told the servants, wait here while we go to worship and come back. He took the wood and gave it to Isaac to carry, while Abraham carried the fire and the knife. And as they were walking, Isaac asked his father, we have fire and wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham answered, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they walked to the place God told him of, and Abraham built an altar and laid the wood and tied up his son and laid him on the wood and lifted the knife. Just then an angel of Jehovah called to him out of heaven and said, Don't lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. Now I know, because I see that you fear God because you did not withhold your only son from me. Abraham then looked up and saw a ram caught in a bush by its horns, and Abraham offered up the ram instead of his son. And Abraham named the place Jehovah-Jireh, which means Jehovah will see to it, as it is said to this day, the Bible tells us, because in the mount of Jehovah it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called out from heaven again and said, Because you have done this and have not withheld your only son, in blessing I will bless you, in multiplying I will multiply you as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gates of his enemies, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice." There is a lot to talk about here. In Christian theology, Abraham offering his son to God as a sacrifice is symbolic of God offering his only son, Jesus Christ, for the sins of mankind. This is what is implied when Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. Jesus is named by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Mount Moriah is actually the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, near where Jesus was crucified. This is what is also implied by the name Jehovah Jireh. In the Mount of Jehovah it will be seen. The lamb caught in the bush represents Jesus, who was offered instead of Abraham's son. He, is our, he, he takes our place for the sin of mankind, to atone for sin. And Abraham, the father of all, offering his son, is referencing God the Father offering his son. And again, we see the physical and the spiritual parallels. The blessing of all nations happened by Jesus Christ taking away the sins of the world. The gospel has been a great blessing to the world as a whole, even to unbelievers. The end of slavery, the rights of the individual, forgiveness and mercy are all concepts that have guided the Christian nations. The Christian nations also have had the upper hand in wartime and have become the policemen of the world in many ways. The idea of holding the gates of one's enemies could also be applied to Israel of ancient times in regards to trade and travel. They were located at the confluence of the world's two largest trade routes. In Beersheba, Abraham then hears about his brother who has a large family now in Aram. They are both Semite. Abraham and his brother descended from Arphaxad. Aram was the brother of Arphaxad. The Aramean people are the children of Aram, and Abraham's brother Nahor lived among the Arameans between the rivers in Haran. In Genesis chapter 24, verse 10, the King James Version translated as Mesopotamia. Actually, in Hebrew, it is Aram Nahar Ahim, which means Aram between the two rivers, which is actually in Upper Mesopotamia. The other part of Aram is in Damascus, 
When Abraham's father moved, he moved to Haran and lived with the Arameans because they were his own people. This may indicate that his home city of Ur was no longer of his own people. The Bible gives a short genealogy of Nahar, Abraham's brother, at the end of chapter 22. Then beginning in chapter 23, Sarah died in Hebron at 127 years old. And Abraham came to mourn and weep for her. He stood up and spoke to the sons of Heth, the Hittites, who were in that land. And he said, I am a stranger living among you. Give me a piece of land for a burying place that I may bury my dead. The Hittites answered, saying, You are a mighty prince among us. You take your choice of burial places among ours, and you may bury your dead. Abraham then stood up and bowed himself to the Hittites and answered, Ask Ephron, the Hittite, to give me the cave of Machpelah, which is at the end of his field. I will give him as much money as it is worth. I will give him for a possession of a burying place among you. Ephron, the Hittite, answered Abraham in the audience of all the Hittites at the gate of the city of Hebron. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave. I give it to you in the presence of my sons and my people. Now bury your dead. And Abraham bowed himself before the people of the land. And he spoke to Ephron the Hittite in the audience of the people of the land and said, If you will give it to me, then hear me. I will give you the money for the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. Ephraim answered Abraham, saying, My Lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So bury your dead. Abraham then weighed out 400 shekels of silver and made sure they agreed upon all the trees that were there and all the borders of it before all the elders of the city. And Abraham there buried Sarah in the cave. This cave is now a sacred site in Israel. It is called the Tomb of the Patriarchs. It contains the remains of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and his wife Rebekah, Jacob and his first wife Leah. Now that concludes Genesis chapter 23. In chapter 24, Abraham sends his chief servant to Mesopotamia to find his brother Nahor and find a wife for Isaac from the children of Nahor. And he made him swear that he will not choose a Canaanite woman for his son. I will leave this chapter to begin the story of Isaac's life in another video. We will skip to chapter 25 for the last part of Abraham's life. Abraham took another wife named Keturah. With Keturah, he had six more sons. These sons' names were Zimran, Joksan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. He gave gifts to the sons of Keturah and sent them into the east to live. At 175 years old, Abraham died and his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave where his wife Sarah was buried. In conclusion, Abraham is the father of the three great Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. They all trace back to Abraham, and they all are attested to by God in the book of Genesis.